Well, since we last saw each other, the Zendo has been to four major events around the world. Um, can I get a show of hands of who here has been a Zendo volunteer since we started in 2012? All right, awesome. And who here is in their second year? Great. So we have a lot of old faces and a lot of new faces. Um, over the past year, we've been to an event in Costa Rica called Envision. Who here went to Envision? Yeah. And we also went to an event in San Francisco called Bicycle Day. Um, and then an event in California called Lightning in a Bottle, which these two ladies, Sarah and Chelsea, my co-coordinators, headed up. And then we went to the largest regional burn, which is in South Africa. It's called Africa Burn. And um, I went there with Catherine McLean. And I'm happy to say that this model that we are working on here has become an integral part of health and safety at those events. And it's, it's taken off. And especially for this year, we have, like I said, a phenomenal team, including 20 medical volunteers and 20 shift leads. And we, um, we will have the main Zendo structure, which actually had a little faux pas yesterday. After the rains, the roof actually caved in. So we're working to salvage it and put Lycra over the top. And we're also going to have a teepee space that we will use um, for this purpose. And thirdly, we have a beautiful little Zendo pod that has a 40 by 40 foot shade structure. And we will have that for guests to um, hang out in and for volunteers to hang out. And we also have a tea house, a beautiful golden structure that we'll show you all towards the tail end of this training. And we can also use that space. So this is a beautiful village and I am so thankful that we have had the opportunity to be hosted this year by Beaumarage Village. And I just want to give a great big thank you to David and the camp team for the generosity. And um, I think David would like to say a, a couple words before we dive in. David? Thank you, Lene. Uh, so I'll just text this real quick. Close down. All right, so uh, welcome Zendo volunteers. Uh, it's, you know, it's our honor uh, on behalf of Foam Orange and Foam Ads everywhere to host you and support you in your mission and service. Uh, you're doing some of the highest level work on the planet. Um, you know, it's definitely one of my personal goals along with all the MAP staff and board members to wisely integrate psychedelic medicine and allies in the culture and you know promote intentional use and positive outcomes yeah um yeah, man. yeah. so but you know uh, even in, a, in the most controlled set and setting uh you know these powerful allies can spin us out in the really dark shameful death you know places that are very very difficult and having a space on playa where you someone can go when they're navigating through this and have people hold space and help them navigate through and have a positive outcome is just so huge. Um, I mean, we all want to get to the place of, you know, connectedness and love and, you know, being down with the goddess who's making love with reality. And that's, you know, that's the best, but the other side happens all too often. So, um, anyways, uh, you know, we're, we're just very thankful. Um, you know, a lot of myself, a lot of my family and friends here have been helped in a huge way. Um, I'd like to say we're not only supporters of Zendo, we're also clients. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm yeah. glad it's like right over there. I can crawl over there later in the week. All right, thank you. So, the mission of the Zendo project is firstly to create a safe space for anybody that's undergoing a difficult psychedelic experience in order to help transform that experience into one that can provide um, an opportunity for learning and possibly even some personal growth and development. And the second part of our mission is to provide a setting where volunteers can receive training 
and feedback for one another. And I really want to emphasize this point because this training right now is important, but I think the real crux of this work is whenever you're on shift together and when you see somebody doing something that you just thought, wow, that was really, really good and effective, you have the opportunity to give them that feedback and to help them hone in on those skills. And alternatively, if you see something that you thought, hmm, I wonder if we could have tried something a little bit differently and what could that have looked like? You have the opportunity to engage them in that conversation and be one another's teachers in this. We all have such different backgrounds and skill level. And I really encourage you all to come forth and engage with one another. Talk about how you got here and what skills you're bringing. And, and really just engage as one another's teachers. Um, the third part of our mission is to demonstrate that we, the psychedelic community, can take care of our own and we can have positive and negative transformative experiences without the need for law enforcement-based prohibitionist policies. So I had the opportunity to go to a really cool workshop this past February. It was in Joshua Tree, and it was a week-long holotropic breathwork training. Um, who here has heard of holotropic breathwork? Sweet. Awesome. So Stan Groff, that name ring, rings a bell? Awesome. Um, well, for those few people who didn't raise their hands, holotropic breathwork is just this practice um, that by Deep breathing, continuous breathing. <laughs> um, and coupled with music and a guide, you, um, people access non-ordinary states of consciousness that can be compared to that of LSD or psilocybin. And people have archetypal experiences, a rebirthing experience, even a death experience. Um, so I went to a week-long training with Stan and Diane Haug and the topic was psychedelic emergency. It translates really well to this work. If any of you are interested in doing it, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, so I learned a lot of good stuff there. And the first day, we talked about how, sure, we may call it emergency, but emergency and emergence are two sides of the same coin. And when it looks like somebody is having an intense psychedelic crisis, what might really be happening is that there is an awakening happening and their real essence, their real self is coming forth. And it can look ugly at the time. And if we hold them with enough safety and support, we can help with that birthing process. Catherine McLean, my friend who I went to Africa burn with, she says, we're like spiritual midwives, you know, we just, we just kind of sit there and, and let it come up. There's not a whole lot that we can really do. Um, and, you know, I, I love the language that I learned from working with Diane and Stan because they, they talk about this work that we do as an ancient tradition that has been going on for many, many generations where we sit and bear witness to someone's transformation and be with their real rawness and vulnerability and where we just provide that support. And it reminds me of the meaning of the term compassion, which means suffering together, allowing ourselves to see the suffering in another human being and connecting with that place in ourselves. Because it's that empathy that heals. Um, the Dalai Lama says that Love and compassion are not luxuries, but necessities if humanity is to survive. And I think all of us here truly do believe that. And this work that we do is a testament to that. So I think we're also all here because we know what powerful tools psychedelics are. And most of us have probably ourselves had some scary experiences and you know, we, we talk about how it's so important to prepare and to um, you know, go in with a, with a clear intention. 
we all know that even with the, all the preparation in the world, we can still have a gnarly trip. <laughs> um, Stan calls psychedelics non-specific amplifiers. They're just bringing forth what's already inside of us. And he said that it's whatever has a strong emotional charge and is close enough to the surface that will come up to be reprocessed. And a lot of times that is early childhood trauma that we might not even be aware that we experienced. So when we're working with guests this week, that's just an important thing to keep in mind that um, we may have no idea what's going on, but they could be reprocessing some really heavy shit that they didn't even know that they were holding on to. Um, Stan also says that LSD is to the mind what the microscope is to biology and the telescope is to astronomy. So these are powerful tools that, when used, can allow us to see our psychological processes so much more clearly and you know, potentially gain healing. And it is the belief of many people who do work with these psychedelics that we're able to tap into our own inner healer when we're doing this work and that we're always moving towards fullness. And again, it's all about the set and setting. So, can somebody tell me what I mean when I say set and setting? Pretty please. Yes. Uh, your set is... Can you come up please? Uh, set and setting has to do with where you're coming from and all the, uh, your mindset. What you know, may have happened during that day, the previous week, your, what's kind of going on in your head. And then the setting is what's going on around you at the time of your experience that can uh, come in at the same time because psychedelics tend to make you permeable. And I think that the setting kind of permeates you and so it's this kind of interplay between those two different worlds. Thank you. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So the first principle of psychedelic harm reduction is to create a safe space. And for me, that means a place where I can just lie down, be flat with my eyes closed, and go into my experience. And if I need a cup of water or help to the bathroom, that I will have that assistance. There's a lot of other factors that make a safe space for us. And does anybody want to share for them what, what provides a safe space? Uh, absence of people in uniforms. Absence of people in uniforms, great. <laughs> I agree. Absence of reminders of things that I have to do that are not part of Absence of reminders of your to-do list. Generally a sense of trust that people aren't going to interfere with me or do something to me that I don't want done. Yes. Great. Yeah, absence of trust that you can have your own experience and won't have interference with that. Yeah. Not to be made to talk and account for myself if I'm being nonverbal. Not to have to talk if you're feeling nonverbal. Great. Low lights, soft music, blankets, being warm is really, really important. Um, you know, we, we do our best to create a setting that provides safety and support, but, you know, some of you are going to be out roaming in the field during your shift, and what does a safe space mean whenever you don't even have a dome or something to go into? Someone where they're at is 
thank you. So we, the sitter, the roamer, the volunteer, we become that setting of safety and support. We become that safe space. Um, and you know, we're a mobile safe space whenever we're doing this work together. Um, and I just want to share that at multiple festivals now, we've actually had people who have come in as guests into the Zendo space move their tents to right beside our space because for whatever reason they had stuff going on, it was catalyzed by a psychedelic experience, but then they just really needed to be nearby to feel safe. So the second principle is sitting, not guiding. And whenever I think about guiding, the most extreme form of it would be shamanism, where the shaman, him or herself, takes the sacrament and leads the person through a journey, and the person doesn't even take the psychedelic. Um, this is really important because when we do this work, we really just want to be that calm, supportive, safe presence. We aren't the one who knows the terrain. The person we're sitting for knows their psychological terrain so much better than we do. And we really can't do much than either for them. And, you know, encourage them to trust in their own inner healing. Um, there's some really helpful metaphors that I use sometimes whenever I do this work. I just remind people that, you know, our psyche has its own way of, of healing. And the way that a tree and plants know to grow towards light that's how our body and our psyche knows to heal. Michael Mithoffer, who is the um, lead psychiatrist in MAPS MDMA studies, gives another great metaphor. He was a ER doctor for many, many years, and you know he recounts having patients come in after you know a horrible accident, and you know their arm would be covered in in road rash. Well, as the doctor, all that he can actually do is remove the, the road rash, remove the pieces, remove the blockages to healing, and then the body knows how to heal itself. And it's really important whenever we're doing this work to keep that in mind, that that person is their own healer. And this is probably one of the hardest things about this work because I myself am a pathological fixer. When I see that something could be better, I wanna fix it, I wanna make it better. And I think that's why I love this work, because it's a practice in not doing. <laughs> and Maya Angelou has a perfect quote for this. She says, people will forget what you said and what you did, but they will never forget the way you made them feel. So just keep that in mind. You don't have to say, you don't have to do, just being is 99% of the time all that they need. So like I said, most of this work is just presence. But sometimes, you know, later in the trip, when somebody's more verbal and they're open to some peer-to-peer -peer support, you can engage in a more therapeutic style as long as it's within the scope of your practice. And by doing that, you know, it's effective to just ask them to surrender into the experience, to go into the tension, to go into the, the scary, terrifying place and just do your best to stay with it, to breathe into it. Um, a wonderful mantra that I picked up from some of the Hefter people is trust, let go, be open. We'll have a sign that says that in this space. And funny enough, I, uh, I've been talking about that in trainings for about a year now. And it dawned on me that we as sitters need to be replaying that mantra in our minds. We need to trust in the person's process and whatever it was that they took, that it's, it's running its course to let go to whatever outcome we wish for this person and to be open to whatever arises in their process and in us. And whenever it gets really intense, I sometimes will remind the person that these emotions and these sensations have evolved over time for our safety and protection. Anger, rage, sadness, depression. They have evolved with us human beings. We have them for a reason. They're part of our human experience. 
And um, yeah, I wanna I wanna read a poem. It's by Rumi, and it's called the Guest House. And actually, it was included in the map, um, the guide that you received whenever you got into the gate. And I think that it just really captures the fact that we are always having emotions come through us and just to let that happen. So this being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from above. The last and final principle that I talk about is that difficult is not the same as bad. I think all of us in here can attest to the fact that some of our most challenging experiences at the end of the day wind up being our most valuable. And there was actually a survey done at Johns Hopkins where they surveyed 2,000 people who all had reported having a difficult experience with the psychedelic. And 80% of those people said that they benefited from the experience. And 20% said that it was among the top five most spiritual experiences of their lifetime. So we really never know what's going on with the guests when we're working with them. And we don't find out until they come back later to integrate. And that is always the best case scenario. I always try and stay with the guests through the entire duration of their stay, unless I need to take care of myself. Um, but at the end of their stay, or if they fall asleep, I'll leave them a note that says, you know, hey, come back. I'll, I'll be happy to integrate with you tomorrow. If you want to meet back here at 6 p.m., we can take a walk or something. And, you know, there was this one experience that we had maybe a year and a half ago with, with one of our most challenging guests um, at a different festival. And, you know, he almost had to be hospitalized. It was really scary. And it was a long, arduous trip. And, he wound up coming back the next day to say, wow, that was really cool. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but that was, that was fun. <laughs> so we, we never know. And on the flip side, somebody can be having what looks like to be a pretty low key experience to find out the next day that it was one of their most terrifying days. And some people are just really good at hiding it. So just trust that Whatever's going on could be really profound. And just to bring all the compassion that you can to the table. So as sitters, you know, trust, let go, be open. Stay really aware of your breath. Check in with what's going on with your own process. If you're feeling tired, or heaven forbid, if you get bored, it happens, and it's okay. Get curious, get really curious about the person's story, about what is going on with them, and the likeness that you two share. If you're feeling impatient, or you're just having a really hard time being compassionate for the person that you're working with, imagine them as a five-year-old, because we know that we can regress into younger states when we do this work. So just hold them in your mind and in your heart as a young, scared child who may be reprocessing something that happened to them at a young age when they didn't have the holding and the support that they needed and that you may be providing that support that they needed at the time. 
and that is their corrective emotional experience that could be life-changing and transformative. And if you do that and it still doesn't work and you're having a hard time, kick it sideways, tell your ship lead, and we will bring another sitter in. Um, I always try and match the person who I'm sitting with. If they're, if, you know, there's a lot of laughing and playfulness going on, I, I allow myself to show up in that way. Um, having a sense of humor is great if they're in that place. And if they want to get to know you, I think self-disclosure is great. It helps to build rapport. And, you know, you're bearing witness to a very vulnerable experience that they're having. So they might just want to be your friend. So I think I'm going to stop talking now. And I'm going to hand over the mic. But again, just thank you all so much for doing this work, for being here, for showing up, and for being role models for this work. And I'll just end with a quote that was introduced to me a couple months ago that has helped me immensely on my path towards becoming a therapist. It's by, her name is Lila Watson, and she's an Australian Aboriginal elder. And she said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. <laughs> but if you know that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. Every guest we work with this week is our teacher. So thank you, and I look forward to getting to know all of you, and I hope you have a wonderful, safe day. Real briefly, we're gonna um, have just a quick announcement about schedule amendments, because I know you all have a lot of questions about that. And then we're gonna hear from Sarah and George Greer and Shilo and Ron from ESD. And then we're gonna hear a bit from Annie about ethics. And then at two o'clock, what's gonna happen is we're gonna break up into small groups and we'll count you off. And half of us will go into the Golden Tea House and then the other half will go into the TP Zendopod area, and each small group will have one shift lead and one medical volunteer, and we will review and discuss the logistics for volunteering. And before Kinthea goes, can I have all of the shift leads stand up because I'd like to give you a shift lead manual. And I'd also like a round of applause for these leaders. Hello, everyone. This mic does work better. Hi. Hi. I'm Tanthea, um, and I made the schedule. Yay. There are actually two of these. This one goes from Wednesday to Friday, and the other one goes from Saturday to Monday, but we're just having an example right now. Um, we'll hang them up in the Zendo. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to look at your shifts. Um, I, I sent it out in your email. Um, I'll tell you what to do if you haven't here in a minute. And I know you do have questions, but um, yeah, please just let me run through a few things um, and I'll tell you how to come and find me if there's something else that I didn't address. Um, but basically, yeah, just the, the basics of it. Um, a couple people emailed me, you did notice, if you provided a client name on your application, I did list you by your client name on the schedule. Um, I was kind of assuming that people like to be playa named on the playa, but um, sometimes you might not. So if you're listed as a name that you would like us to not list you as, I'm sorry, um, we can change it. Um, I have, we'll have markers and stuff to make changes if we want to, or in the future I'll make sure to ask people which name they prefer here, because I know it's a little different than the rest of Burning Man. Um, but if you didn't find yourself, or if you had a question, that's why. If you gave us a client name, I, I listed you that way. Um, also, I've had a couple questions, and so I'm not singling anyone out because several people did ask me, and they asked me last year too, and I forgot to say something about it in the email. Um, if you have a shift that starts at 2 a.m., then, um, for example, if it starts on Thursday at 2 a.m., that is known by most people as Wednesday night. Um, so if you're thinking about it as Thursday morning or Thursday night, then it's, you're going to get confused. And so just please make sure you look really carefully at your times and do a little math, even though it's, it's, it's challenging sometimes. Um, and and just, just be sure, because we do get, it, it's confusing. Um, and we did this, we used to start them at midnight and at noon and at six, 
and we found that this was a lot easier because um, noon sucks and uh, <laughs> so does 6 a.m. So, so shifting it this way made, has made things a lot easier, but it, it is a little wonky. But um, as you've all seen, I think, and, and just everybody, if there's anyone new who's here, who's come in the last, la contacted us at the last minute, um, we'll be open for 24 hours starting um, tomorrow at 2 p.m. and ending on Monday at 2 p.m. So there's four shifts a day. Um, so just, we'll put these up. I'm gonna be over at the side um, to take questions and you can come check if you need to look at it again if you don't have a copy. Um, and so, yeah, and you can see the yellow shifts that are on the schedule are the shifts that are still open. We're doing pretty good. Um, most of the shifts that are open are greeter shifts, which is not always really necessary. We found, last year we were on the Esplanade, and so there were a lot of people that just kind of walked by and were like, hey, what's this thing? It's made out of cardboard. I like cardboard. That's cool. And so we had to have someone kind of as a fence. Um, and it might be different this year or it might not. You know, But basically, it's just to make sure the people as they walk in that they get oriented and you kind of head them in the right direction and stuff. So other people can take that role on um, depending on the shift. We tried, you know, there's, there's often more people um, than we need at a time and so that and just check with your shift lead and you know talk to people and if you're comfortable assuming another role and you see that it's not being done then just speak up um, it's good to get training on some of the other things um, because it's really the greeter thing too we just didn't assign people who hadn't really volunteered before because it's kind of weird to welcome people to a space when you're just getting to know it yourself so um, but some people take that role on really naturally so so yeah feel free to step up if that feels comfortable to you um, and also what I did with we had a lot of people volunteering. This is awesome. I don't know, there, there are 104 people on the schedule, um, and we have more than 150 applications, so it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. And um, so people, when, you know, there were, there were so many people that they're just kind of from overflow spaces. So these spaces that say shadow space in Rome, if you're in one of those, those are like because your availability didn't match any of the other openings, but it's fine. We have a couple extra people. And so that too, if nobody shows up, if somebody doesn't show up, if something happens, you know, if there's something that needs to be cleaned up and tidied, if there's little extra stuff to do, then you can check in and that would be, um, you can do that first. And then you could um, potentially shadow someone if there was someone on shift that was comfortable with that, if you, you know, resonate with someone, or you could be an extra roamer. Um, either we didn't assign roam shifts during the daytime most of the time because um, we, yeah, it's hot, and, and there's more stuff to find at night. But um, so um, anyway, but you could still do it, or you could you could just you know nominate other ways to go out and just support the Zendo and support the other people in it. Um, and in that sense too, if there are a couple open sitter shifts, and if you're assigned to one of those shifts, and again we, we didn't we assigned all the brand new people to roaming shifts kind of first, so you can get to know um, the space and the sort of the feel of it and the energy, and you can do that before you become a sitter, um, unless we had some. You know, we knew you personally, or we knew that you were super experienced, but we know that a lot of you are, and we just don't know it, and so that wasn't meant as some, any kind of, you know, jab or something. It's, we want to get, it's great to have so many people that are able to learn from each other, like Lene was saying, um, but so if you're there and you're assigned to a roam shift and they need more sitters, um, you also, your shift lead might be able to, you know, help you could get a promotion. So um, uh, just, just we'll feel it out by, by it, and part of how it's working is we have this little overflow space to sort of fill the bubbles. And if you're in one of those roam shifts and, you, and you'd rather go to one of the times when there is an open shift or something, um, that could be one of the requests that would be pretty easy for us to do. Um, you have a quick question? That's a complicated question. I don't know if I should get into that now. Yeah, and talk to people. Whoa, if you if you do encounter them. <laughs> we'll hand that out. Yeah. So I'm almost almost done. We also have some stickers that Chelsea's gonna pass around. That um, I would love if you all just went out and promoted the Zendo. The most powerful way to talk about this work is through word of mouth. So if you're at any other camps, just go up and tell people about our work. Tell them about the structure that we're gonna have and that will be open 24-7 starting Wednesday afternoon until Monday after the temple burn. The address is on the sticker. Yes, yeah, cool. That we, we just printed those, like, and um, they are very helpful. So in some ways, you're on shift all the time, uh, but only when it's fun. <laughs>
Okay, oh, so the last few things, the only shifts that are on there uh, that we really, really need to fill um, are the open medical shifts, and there's really only one, um, which is Sunday morning at 8 a.m., um, and so um, I'm, that's been the high priority, and a couple people have, I have sent emails, and they were waiting on things, and, t and so if, if you're one of those people, try to find me, and say, I'm going to be over here in the corner, um, so on breaks, if people with like high priority request items can come to me, so first of all, the medical volunteers, if as many of the medical volunteers um, as can, and especially if you're willing to trade your shifts around or you, you, you want to pick up another shift or something like that, we can all come check in over there so that we can fill the medical shift first. We've got one new medical person. We've got one new medical person. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so, so we just, that's the, that's the one that we really need to make sure that we're covered. So if anybody who is a medical volunteer um, can um, just check in and, and to make sure that we get that done. That'd be great. I think we will with the wiggle room we had, so that's awesome. Otherwise, if it's just an emergency, if you really seriously can't do something or, or there's there's an error of some kind, or um, you can find me at the break, or if you're brand new, if you're one of the people who has come in um, because you talked to Lene in the last you know week or so or you know, something, we know there's a few people that, that we were referred from and who didn't go through the whole application process. So if you're not actually on the schedule and you'd like to be, um, then come and find me during the breaks too. Um, otherwise, what I'm going to do is during that breakout session time that Lene was talking about when you guys are talking to the shift leads and stuff, I'm just kind of wander around. Um, and so if you have, and then I'll check in with everybody and make sure that you agree to your shifts, that they make sense. And if you have a request, you can just tell me at that time. So I'll keep a little tally of them and see what I can do. And then after everything, if you'll just come to me, um, I'll just stay here. Can I stay? Are we going to be, is something happening in here? At, at, yeah. yeah. So maybe just buy the actual Zendo. Is that, or is... What's the, what's, so, okay, we're just, but where's, where's the other space? The, the golden tea house. The golden tea house. Okay, so may I'll stay over there, and you guys can come and find me if you, if, if you gave me a request, or there's still some pending problem about the schedule, or you have some other, you know, question um, that I can hopefully answer, just, just check in with me afterwards, and hopefully I'll have it, you know, as sorted out as I can by then, and it won't take too long, but I appreciate your patience, and, you know, yeah, we want to try to accommodate everything we can, just making sure everything is covered, and, yeah, it was great to see all your names and see how many people we have coming, and um, it starts to feel real when we start actually putting it down on the schedule. So um, thanks again, and I will be quiet now. So welcome. I'll see you soon. Next up, I would like to introduce my co-coordinator and my right-hand woman, Sarah Giron. Sarah and I met here in 2012 when we started this project and she's been to a lot of events with me and she is one of the best damn sitters I know and she's a Boulder-based transpersonal psychotherapist and she's going to share a bit about her work and working with the body, working with trauma, sitter self-care, and integration. Hello. Okay. I just want to take a moment um, to invite anyone who wants to, and if you want to get up and just move or shake or turn around or jump up and down, anyone. It's cool if you don't want to. <laughs> just because we've been sitting for a little while, I can feel it in my body. And stretching, taking some deep breaths. This is something that's really important to do when you're working in the Zendo. Lots of breaks, lots of stretch breaks. Am I touching this wrong? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about working with trauma, how to work with trauma um, when it arises in um, a difficult psychedelic experience, and how to work with the body. And the reason why we're looking at the body and how to work somatically and help people um, process somatically when they're um, on a psychedelic is because the body is the gateway into the subconscious. So a lot of the processing that happens when someone is going through a psychedelic journey is somatic. Um, a lot of it is mental, a lot of it is emotional. Um, the somatic 
realm, the body realm, is great because it is um, a very dense frequency. So when we talk about the mental body, the emotional body, and the physical body, they're all varying densities of vibration. Um, and the, why I really like working with the body as a gateway in is because it's sometimes, for most of us, the most visible density. Um, so when, and also because trauma is stored in the body. So when we have a uh, traumatic experience, whether it's as adults or children, um, that energy, whether it's emotional, physical, um, sexual, mental trauma, gets stored in the tissues and the cells of our body and becomes locked. So when we take a psychedelic, it helps to catalyze, as Lene was saying, the natural healing process of the body. And as the, as the medicine helps catalyze that release of the stuck trauma energy, um, then that is what we, what we see often show up. What happens is that when that natural healing happens, when that um, energy release is catalyzed, if someone doesn't feel in a safe setting or set to surrender to the experience of the catalyzation process, um, that's when they get stuck, often in a difficult experience. So I think it can be really important to remember that difficulty often arises from resistance to the catalyzation of the psychedelic. So at a setting like Burning Man, where there's a lot of unpredictable, our, our MO here is unpredictability, so um, that leads to sometimes for people a feeling of unsafety. So when that when the energy is coming up in their body and in their mind and their emotions, um, they can sometimes not feel safe to process that. Um, and that is part of our survival mechanism. That is part of what keeps us alive on this planet. Um, if we're feeling in an unsafe environment, the, the last thing we're going to do is go into a deep emotional or physical process. So that is why in the Zendo we work on helping to release that resistance through creating a safe space. Also, here on the playa, the set, our mindset, um, is altered in other ways besides just ingesting a psychedelic. So we're tired, um, we're with new community, new family, um, everything's really, really new and novel. Um, sometimes we're not eating as much, not drinking as much water. Um, so the mindset also becomes really altered out here. So because trauma is stored in the body and shows up in the body, I'm gonna just present some tools to working with it when we, um, working with the body as a tool. So one of the things that we try to do is help people to connect with the natural process that their body is wanting to go through. So you'll see that there are movements, gesticulations, um, postures that the body naturally will take on. And so what we do is, as Lene was saying, in Sitting Not Guiding, we help support those naturally arising processes. So we do that through authentic movement, so what that might look like in a sitting but not guiding situation is if somebody is moving, rather than saying, okay, get up and do some jumping jacks or push-ups, we just help, to help them to further the, the movement. So if someone is making um, a particular movement, we invite them to make it bigger. We in invite them to then incorporate sound into the movement. Um, we give them space to, to move around authentically, allow their bodies to move Sometimes this, um, this permission, when it's explicitly stated, can ha really help someone um, to release and go into the energetic movement and complete whatever traumatic experience needs to be healed and needs to be completed. Um, and sometimes it can just be really helpful to give people that permission, because often we can sometimes feel if, especially if someone's having a difficult experience already, can feel constricted um, or scared or um, self, really highly self-aware or insecure about their experience. Um, one thing that we do 
in addition to um, helping to, to support movement is to invite in stillness. So sometimes movement can actually be, um, somebody can be using movement as a distraction away from the trauma that's coming up. So you see that often in movements that are really repetitive. So um, shaking, um, shaking legs, fidgeting, moving around. So, so movements that seem kind of repetitive um, and like they're discharging energy. And that's something that as sitters you can feel, you can see and you can feel in your body when something is just being discharged um, versus something is really being released. So one of the things that we can in invite people into is just stillness. So hey, I invite you to just keep that leg still. I invite you to keep that, that arm still and see what happens. And often what you'll notice is that when they invite part of themselves into stillness, then a bigger movement will come through, a bigger gesticulation, a bigger release will, will come through the body. Um, and that can be even more powerful than just a, a kind of discharge of, of that trauma energy. So, oh, I like this, this metaphor just came to me um, at the last training and I, I'll share it today. The way that I, um, I can kind of visualize it is that, you know, our geometry, our, um, our structures, um, fit together like gears and when we experience trauma those gears kind of become stuck and so psychedelics kind of act as lubricants to those gears they help get those gears moving and so we're just really supporting the movement of the that gear catalyzation process um, so also with the body I think that that's a good place to, to segue into sitter self-care. So what um, I invited you all into when we first sat down of getting up and moving around, um, we really encourage our sitters to do that frequently, to move energy. So going out, doing some qigong, doing some tai chi, doing some yoga, really moving their own bodies. Um, we really want our, our sitters to take really good care of themselves because if you're not taking good care of yourself, you can't sit and be present for somebody else. So taking a lot of time to take care of your own bodily needs, um, eating, drinking lots of water, taking breaks if you can, is really important. Um, sometimes we can experience vicarious trauma from from an experience. So if somebody is having an experience that's bringing up something that is familiar in our life, and I'll just say here that it's, it's all familiar because since we all are one being, every trauma that any individual has experienced in their life, we all have experienced as a collective. Um, so when we see intense, difficult experiences and trauma coming up for people, um, sometimes it can really, it can trigger us as individuals. And so, um, in order to avoid um, really taking on a lot of what somebody is going through, if it's something that's really affecting you, we really encourage you to, as Lene says, really kick it sideways, give it to, to somebody else, um, you know, letting the person know that that, that, that handoff is being made and, and really communicating that. Um, but like we spoke, really if you can't be present for someone because you're, you're stuck in your own process and you're so triggered by the experience, um, then it's actually a disservice to them and it's a disservice to yourself. So really just taking good care of yourself and your body. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about is integration. I came up with a little acronym for integration called ICE, something we all need on the playa. Um, and that stands for intention, community, and embodiment. Um, so in the Zendo, we work with people who are in the acute phase of integration. So they, they've either been with us all the way through their journey, and then we're helping them to integrate the experience after. Or we also work with people who've had past psychedelic experiences, whether it was two days ago or two years ago, who come in who um, want help in integrating their experience. So some of the tools that we work with, um, the first one is in intention. Uh, so the psychedelic experience really begins when we choose to ingest a substance. Um, and, and making an intention can really often prevent um, having, 
um, a really difficult experience because it ties the threads of the whole experience together. Um, and so we encourage people, if they do come to us before they take something, we really encourage them to have a clear intention around why they're taking something. Um, so to heal relationship with my family, um, to access my creativity, something like that. So really helping to, to support them in creating an intention for their use. Often in the Zendo, we see people after the fact. So most of the time people are coming into us because, um, you know, after they've ingested something. But even then, you can still set an intention. Um, and you'll, you'll see that there often is an intention, even if it wasn't something that was consciously chosen before they ingested something. So um, some helpful questions that you can, can ask them to really um, formulate this intention, even after the fact, is, um, I'll just give a few examples. Now that you've had this experience, what would you like to remember, carry forward, or complete? How can you manifest these visions on the physical plane in your life and work and relationships? How does your experience affect your identity? Who is the person you want to become in your life? And how can this experience contribute to your growth? So these um, questions and other questions that are helping to support intention um, really help people to ground the experience into their body and go forward. So even if they did have a really difficult experience, um, focusing on it as a positive, um, life-changing event, even if it didn't feel like one, um, can help them focus on the potential outcomes and help them to connect with how to use the experience as a catalyst for growth in the future. So the next tool is community. Um, so as many of us know, one of the most difficult aspects of integration is returning home, returning back to a society that doesn't really understand or as a large support the psychedelic exploration. Um, so we really, one of our goals in the Zendo is to be a supportive community space where guests can come to feel this supportive connection um, by listening, mirroring, reflecting, um, reminding an individual that their stories are important, not just to them as individuals, but that they're important to the collective as a whole. Um, and how we really um, aim in the Zendo to create a culture where we share our visions and revelations with each other um, because it is important for all of us to share in these experiences. These are not just individual experiences. Um, you know, this is really bringing the vision home for our communities. So helping somebody who's had a difficult experience or a not difficult experience do that um, can really help them to um, ease into the integration experience because they feel like, okay, this is, this is something that's important. This is something that's relevant, not just to my life, but the, the life of us and our species. Um, so the third tool that, that we talk about is embodiment. So it's pretty easy to ingest a substance and have um, a mind-altering experience. And the difficult, the real work begins when we um, carry what we've learned back into our daily lives. So embodiment is the process of integrating knowledge, wisdom, and experience into the very fabric of one's being. So it is the process whereby ideas become beliefs, practices, and behavior. So one thing that's important to remember is that the mind can, cannot possibly comprehend all of the, the intricate, nuanced experiences of the psychedelic. And often what happens in the integration process is if we try to just understand on a mental level the process that we have experienced, sometimes we can experience anxiety, depression, because we're trying to fit a lot of material um, into just one way of knowing, just one part of knowing. So embodiment is really the process of uh, helping the person, um, supporting them into the other faculties of knowing that they have, um, their heart and their body. Um, so we really believe that, in the Zen, we believe that the heart and the um, body can really hold a lot, can really hold a lot, sometimes more than the mind, um, of our most you know, difficult experiences. So some tools that we offer in the space include, um, as I spoke before, movement, art, talking, playing music, dancing, poetry, writing, um, playing with the language of symbols and archetypes, which can sometimes be more powerful than words, 
Um, and I'll, I'll just prep, I'll just say here as well that this is not just for the process of integration, but embodiment. These tools can also be used during the psychedelic experience. Um, as well as encouraging them to um, step into more embodiment practices when they return home. Uh, w one thing I'll mention about community that is that we really encourage people to find community when they return home. So we pr provide this community space for people to, to engage and to drop in their experience, and then we encourage them to create, if they don't have it at home, a lot of us who come to these festivals are creating communities already in our home environments that are supportive. Um, of these experiences and of the integration of these experiences. Um, but some of us are still, are still building those, so we really encourage people to you know, find people who share your story with people who will really understand and will really hold your story as sacred um, and will not just write you off. Um, so that's really important. So that's a little bit about integration. And I'm going to hand this over. Georgia? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is George Greer. And after this, we're going to take a short break. So George is a psychiatrist and the Hepter Research Institute board president. Medical director. Medical director. And George was also involved in the early days in MDMA research. And besides all that, he's just a really cool guy. And he's going to talk to us about lessons from um, his work and some tidbits about this thing called countertransference. Thank you, Anna. I think everybody here is probably permanently, permanently terminally cool. So, uh, Lynn asked me to speak about countertransference and in uh, psychiatry and psychology, transference is the feelings the patient has about the therapist that relate more to someone else in their life, like a parent, you know, that they have a lot of emotion about. Countertransference are the feelings and thoughts that the therapist has about the patient that relate to someone in the therapist's life that has a charge on it. And of course, to some degree, this is going on all the time in every relationship, except for those of you who are just totally in the moment and not affected by your past. <laughs> so it's going on all the time, you, we, we can't stop it. And uh, for me, setting an intention to just, you know, have whatever I do be for the highest purpose for that client in the moment, that that helps me focus on, on where I where I want to go with my interaction. So, how do you know if it's getting in the way? Because you know, how do you know if it's happening? If you, if you're if you're going down a path with someone who's in an altered state and who is incredibly sensitive and open, how do you know you're you're you think you're helping them, but you're trying to help your mother get over her? neurosis or your brother get over his addiction or whatever how do you know that's not affecting your interaction and i think one main cue is if you feel some tension in your body or you feel some emotional conflict or charge with the person you're sitting with uh, that's a good indication it's probably something about you and your past and a good way to, to find out what it is, is really focus on the body sensation, the feeling that goes with that body sensation without trying to figure it out with your mind, because your mind created the problem in the first place. And, and going with the body feeling, and then the emotion, and, and seeing what comes up, um, might help you have perspective. Okay, this, this I'm feeling is not about this person here who really needs my help, who really needs me to be here for them in this moment. Uh, so that, in, in a nutshell, is the phenomena and a little method to how to be aware of it. And the first step is just be aware of it and try not to just knee-jerk behave like you always do when someone says this, you say that out of habit. Try to just be in the moment, which I think makes this work so exciting because 
the person you're dealing with is in the moment and they don't know what's going to happen next and neither do we, so that helps keep us in the moment. Some little uh, sayings or pearls that, that came to me through my long career in uh, when I was in college, I told the student health service psychiatrist I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And he said, if you want to be a psychiatrist, you should have something else you do for meaning in life. <laughs> because if, if, if you derive meaning in life from your patients getting well, that's not going to work very well all the time because they're going to not do that. And sometimes they will that just to piss you off. You know, just because they are in their transference or whatever. So it took me a while as a therapist to get to the point where I realized, well, you know, I really, I really would like my clients to get well, even if it's not me that heals them. And that was, that was like a big shift for me. It's like, oh, I'm going to be this great person. I'm going to just give darshan to people and they're going to get well you know from interacting with me and it's going to be great and i'm going to feel great about me and it's all about me uh, but really to focus on it's not you know to be okay with them going down some road that's in a worse hole than they were when you started sitting with them you know because uh, 50 50 chance they're going to do that um, Another little saying I like in terms of me and my process and identifying emotions that are uh, obscuring uh, the reality of what's going on out there is, I am never upset for the reason that I think. So if I think, oh, I'm bothered by this and I'm conflicted about it, well, it's probably not that because if I really knew what I was bothered about, I would just solve the problem and move on. You know, but if it's stuck, it's about something else. And so that's just a little trigger for humility. Um, and another thing, uh, and this was from my uh, psychedelic therapy teacher, Leo Zeff. <clears throat> uh, and he would tell people, he'd be like going through their trip, and oh, I did this, and I made this mistake, and I, sh I shouldn't have take this, taken this medicine, and I, I shouldn't have planned it this way, and I shouldn't have done that. And his response was, you can't fuck it up. It's just, the laws of physics do not allow you to do something wrong. It's not possible. I mean, you can think you did something wrong. It's just the universe doing its thing. It doesn't care about you or how you feel. It's just things are happening. And, uh, and to let people, you know, get out of that. Because guilt is all about the ego. I, I'm guilty. I did this. I did that. Bad. You know, the more they can just let go and just feel the really deep process that's happening without controlling it, then they'll get through the processes, which is what people have been uh, telling you here. Uh, another one relates to self-care uh, that you just heard about. And self-care is just extremely important. And it's like in the airplane where they tell you, if you're in an airplane with a child and the oxygen masks come down, you put your mask on before your child's mask. Because if you can't breathe, you're useless to everybody. So if you haven't taken care of your own needs, you're going to be hungry, and that hunger is going to be in the way of your being there for that person. So self-care on the most subtle levels, and having energy, nutrition, and you know, if you feel like you know, I'm confused or whatever, yeah hand it off to somebody else because it's not a service to that person to you know work your stuff out with them or be half present um, so an, an, another concept I, I find useful you probably heard about the concept of set and setting and drug these are the three main factors for psychedelic sessions and the set includes the physical surroundings and the, the sitter or the therapist which is you and so your mental your mental state is part of their set. So your thoughts uh, is expressed through whatever you believe, body language, mind waves, whatever. It affects their experience. And uh, so I think it's very important to ask yourself 
you know, the, the, you, when someone takes a psychedelic, like, what's your intention for, for taking it? Well, I'm asking you now, what's your intention for being a volunteer here in the Zindu, Zindo? And what's in it for you? And just ask that question of yourself on a, on a purely ego level, you know, something in your nervous system gave your body the energy to come over here, sit here, uh, you know, well, it's pretty comfortable and cool today, but to go through some discomfort to be of service to somebody. And I think it's really important to be aware of what your, your ego's agenda has on that. You know, because I, at our core, I believe we're, we are all generous, compassionate beings. But we also have these personalities and egos that have other agendas to, you know, I'm hungry, I need to sleep, I need food, I need sex, I need a relationship, I need to be cool, you know, temperature-wise, etc. Um, and to really just to be conscious, to be conscious of what those ego needs and desires are so that they don't hide from you and, and fool you. And like, oh, okay, I'm really going to learn. I'm really going to learn a lot here. I mean, I, I know people that are, uh, some of my friends are volunteering. I'm going to learn a lot here about how to be a psychedelic therapist. And yes, you will. And um, I actually have, except for in my residency working in psychiatric emergency rooms, really have no experience doing what you're uh, volunteering to do. And I honor you for the, the guts to do that. Uh, because the people who you're serving, you know, they didn't come to Burning Man, well, I hope they didn't come to Burning Man to have an inner psychedelic therapeutic experience because there's a lot of external stimulation going on. Uh, so their, you know, their intention didn't work out, whatever it is. And that, to me, requires a much deeper level of presence and compassion. And plus they're a total stranger, you don't know anything about them. You know, it requires a much deeper level of, of intent and compassion than being a psychedelic therapist. To me, this is like many times harder than being a therapist with someone who's prepared and has their intention and their goals in mind and has a problem they want to solve. So you're all uh, courageous for, for you know, stepping up to do that. So those are the main thoughts I want to, to share with you and open for any questions. Yeah. Let me see if I understand your question. So if you, the sitter, are feeling some discomfort in your gut that you, that you didn't have before you met with him, you ask them if they're feeling something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, my best answer is I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I work in the world of natural science and I can't think of a, a mechanism to explain that other than you know, uh, psychic mind connection between two people or nonverbal language. Uh, I'd say it's 50-50, you know. I mean, it, if you feel something in your stomach, first of all, notice it's in my stomach. And and uh, I guess my first thought is to not say anything because if you if you say something to them, you're intruding on their inner experience and you have no idea what's going on, and they might have said something 10 seconds ago, and now they're in a completely different mindset. So if it were me, I mean, I don't, I don't do that. I guess that's what I can say. You know, I've seen therapists that do that. You know, I'm thinking about a duck. Are you thinking about a duck? Well, no, not really. So, so I, yeah. So, so I, 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 I can't say that's not valid because I'm sure that it works at times. Uh, but it's just not something that sort of, as a principle, that I personally would do. Any other questions? Yeah.
Well, there, there's are conceptual terms that are based on some theoretical system about what's going on, and uh, I don't know what their official definition would be. I, I'm guessing it's there's a lot of emotion. There's a wave of emotion, crying, anger, fear, shaking, activity, and then it subsides, and that's, quote, discharge or release. Now, see, my attitude is I don't, I'm not here to help them discharge. I'm just here to be with whatever happens. And if they don't discharge, if they feel like they're going into this existential no exit place even deeper and nothing makes any sense, that's okay. You know, we're just here now and it's just, it's all in their mind and it's going on and if they go up, they go down, they go around, they discharge. Uh, I have a friend who's a rolfer and he's done body work for decades and people have emotion during rolfing and he's, he's kind of a physical or a guy I said okay here's some crying throw the raw for a bone you know I gave you some emotion you know it's like he, he just lets them do it but he doesn't try to okay more 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 you know come on get it out get it out just trust the process within them because we don't know we do not understand what's going on with people I mean I don't when I another quote was from Terrence McKenna it's like well if you're going to take you know this seven grams of mushrooms and the five grams in the middle of the night and all this I mean don't you need someone there to help you he goes no one can help you anyway <laughs> so any other questions okay thank you go for it you guys are great Okay, sorry to tease you with a break right now, but we're gonna wait another 10 minutes because we have some really yummy snacks coming out thanks to the Faux Mirage kitchen staff. And I would like to break whenever they come out, so it will be soon. And the next speaker that we're going to hear from is a dear friend and one of the most badass ladies I know, Annie Oak, founder of the Women's Visionary Congress and also founder of the Full Circle Tea House which is here on Playa. It's a sister space to the Zendo with a very similar philosophy. And the, the harm reduction space is centered around the tea ceremony. And I've asked Annie to speak a bit about the ethics involved in being a sitter. So please help me to welcome Annie. Thank you. Good afternoon, you all. I wanted to say a couple of things about the ethics of sitting for our guests. And uh, a lot of you have a lot of experience. Some of you have a little less experience. But we all bring our innate knowledge and understanding of compassion and care to this work. So I'm going to ask you first to trust your good instincts on this. You have a lot of innate knowledge that you can work with. You work with other people in your lives. You have other situations and other training, other education that you bring to this work. And bring the best of it here to the playa because people will require and ask for the best of you. So bring your whole toolkit, everything you've learned, all the kindness that people have shown you and your challenging moments and your full self to be present for other people. I'd like to also make some specific suggestions that have been helpful for those of us who have done this work for a number of years. Some of them are going to seem obvious and some are going to be a little less obvious to us. And then I'll take some questions and we'll get some suggestions from the wise people in this room as well. We have a lot of wisdom here among us. This is going to sound obvious, but it's important to say it's really essential that we maintain the confidentiality of our guests, of their experiences inside the Zendo, of the things they say, of the processes and emotions that they go through, People are vulnerable, they're in a wide open space. 
They're putting themselves in our care. And we really owe them a private place to have those experiences. So maintain the confidentiality of the people that you serve and allow them to feel that this space, the Zendo, is a private place and a safe place where they can discharge energy and they can be their true selves and they can work through intense emotions and feelings as they need to and that they can, they can trust you to hold that information in a sacred and safe way. The other thing that I would recommend is that you be really aware of your own boundaries when you do this work. Your own energetic boundaries, your physical boundaries, and also the boundaries of the people that you're serving. If people and as they often do, as George has just said, engage in transference, and you're engaging in counter-transference. You know, there's a lot going on that is very complicated. But keep your own boundaries intact. Know that you're a healer, and that you're there for them. And they might want to, because they're making an intense connection with you, perhaps make an effort to get in touch with you, or be friends with you or get to know you outside this space. Use your good judgment with that. If you really feel like you need to put up a boundary between yourself and your guest that you're serving in that moment, and that your relationship is going to be in that present moment and take place inside that space only and not outside that space, enforce that boundary and feel good about enforcing that boundary. If you feel like you want to get to know that person outside the space, that's your decision, but use your wise discretion and know that people will be engaged in transference and be projecting a lot of emotion onto you. So just use your wisdom with that and be very careful. The other thing I would say is if you do decide to get to know a guest outside the Zendo, you might want to think twice before you go off nipping off to faux mirage and get all naked together. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tempting, you know, but just, just think about that a little bit. Remember, remember that you're caring for people in a very vulnerable place. They might come on to you in a sexual way. It would probably be a good idea to deflect some of that and, and hold them in a sacred way and just be mindful of that type of energy and use your own good judgment with that. Also, I'm going to suggest respectfully, and you will also continue to use your good judgment with this, think about providing care in a space where you're at baseline. Don't provide care in an altered space. I personally believe, and this is just my belief, that we are the grounding energy that allows other people to come back into their selves when they're altered. And so we have a duty to be grounded and centered and at our own baseline and energetically strong for other people. So if you're going to get altered out here during the event, plan those adventures carefully and come back down to your own energetic baseline before you serve other people. And this, of course, ties into all the things about self-care that Sarah wisely said and George echoed, is that we need to take care of ourselves first. We need to be well hydrated, we need to eat well, we need to get some sleep, we need to come to this work energetically strong and centered and coming from it, from our own best places, from our own wisest places. So when you look at your weekly playa schedule, you might want to plan your own psychedelic adventures accordingly so that you can fully return to baseline, be well slept, well hydrated, and in your own power before you serve other people. If somebody in your care decides that they want to up and go just leave. They've had enough. Thank you very much. Zendo is lovely. I'm leaving now. They have a right to leave. There are two exceptions to that. 
And I have checked in with Lene about this because you want to be consistent in your policy. One exception might be if they're getting medical care that's essential to their well-being. And another exception may be that they're having an interaction with law enforcement, which might happen out here to people inside the Zendo. One needs to accept these potential things that may happen and accept them with grace. But in general, people in your care can just stand up and say, this has been great, I'm out of here, bye-bye. And you must give them the space to go. And it's hard to release people in your care sometimes, especially when you think that they really need to be in that space. In some care spaces, caregivers sometimes get up and they might shadow a person going through the city to make sure they don't stand in the path of a vehicle or don't injure themselves. Some people have done that. You may use your own good judgment. Some people might suggest to the person who wants to up and go that, hey, maybe we can take a walk together. If you'd like to leave this space and maybe there are enough sitters present, maybe you can go with them and take a walk and discharge some energy that way. Use your own good judgment, but people have a right to leave and we cannot hold them within this space. Also, treat the people who come with your guests friends, family, concerned people, with respect. They care about that person in your care, and you should treat them with a great deal of care and respect as well. They'll often be here at the Zendo, concerned, worried about their friend. You'll want to check in with them, give them a status update. You may or may not want them in the space with the person. They might be circulating outside here in this camp. Make sure that they're being cared for and that they're being supported because they are worried about their friend often or their family member. So don't forget their needs as well. I'm going to go to my second page. Patience. Remember that people need to integrate and that this sometimes, this work takes a lot of patience. Don't rush people in their process. Encourage them to integrate either in the Zendo or make sure that they have a good place to go back to integrate to their camp, another place where they feel safe, a person they feel safe with, a group of people who came and brought them. Encourage them to continue on that integration process. The tea house that we have built on the other side of the city, the Full Circle Tea House, is often used by people for integration. We also do some sitting there for people. We're your sister project on the other side of the city. But many people come just to rest and to hydrate and to drink tea and to be with other people and integrate their experiences. And so encourage people to do that. It's an essential part of the process and it takes time and that they need to rest and eat well and hydrate while they're doing that, of course. Do not try to impose your own value system or your own healing modality on other people. It's really important. You come with your own knowledge and your own training, and I'm sure you'll use it in a very wise and appropriate way. But remember, not to let that training or your belief system get in the way of their own process, the guest's process, and give them a lot of space to explore their process without imposing the things that you have learned. Use that knowledge gently and wisely. If you're not being effective with the guest, and I think Lene said this, kick it sideways. Just don't let your ego get caught up in being a healer or a sitter. To say, you know, I'm, maybe I'm not being effective with this person. This person deserves somebody else who can maybe be more effective with them. I'm going to kick it sideways to this beautiful person I'm working with here in the Zendo. Get to know the people you're working with, understand their strengths and their own weaknesses. We all have things that are hot button issues for us. And it's often good to know at the beginning of, of your shift what those hot button issues are for each other so that we know our strengths and weaknesses on a given shift. 
and we can say, this is not my strength, but this is your strength. This person should be working with you. And as Lene said, she or other people who are managing that shift will often try to take measure of your strength and weakness and give people, give guests to the right sitter. But be aware of your own strengths and weaknesses and be honest with that. And just say, hey, you know, there's another person who could do this better. I'm going to give that to them. Don't get your ego tied up in this. Also be honest with the guests. Be honest with the things that they tell you. If they tell you something and that sounds dangerous to you, you don't necessarily need to get them alarmed about those thoughts. We often say things that may sound dangerous to other people, but be honest about your thoughts. You know, you can say, you know, it's really interesting, but you know, sitting on the top of that scaffolding during the lightning storm, that, that might be a little that could be a little dangerous maybe. That might be that might be um, you know, get struck by lightning. Be honest about how you feel about what people tell you. And don't parrot their words back to them. You know, just give them the benefit of your full and honest thoughts. Also, and, and this was said, and I, I guess it's worth saying again, just about self-care. Self you know, it's, um, it's really good to check in with yourself emotionally at the beginning of each shift and really take stock of yourself and just decide whether or not you're really feeling up to doing this work. And if for some reason you're not, be honest about that. Just say, I'm really tired, or I had something really intense happen to me last night, or I might just not be at 100%. Is there some other way I could help out? Is there some other service that I could do? Is there some other shift that I could take? Exchange a shift with somebody else, but be really honest with yourself about where you are when you come into the work. Also, try to come to the work clean, not just emotionally, but physically. Smell good. You'll be hugging a lot of people. Go to Fon Mirage and go wash off, you know. Be careful about using a lot of intense essential oils on your own body because that could trigger some people. Wash your hands. At the end of every tea house shift and every zendo shift and sanctuary shift I've done, I, I do a simple ritual where I have somebody pour water over my hands, ideally salt water, as a way to cleanse the energy of those people we've been working with off us, to make us receptive to new energy, to heal ourselves and keep ourselves strong. Do a cleansing ritual of your own at the end of every shift so that you can let go of that energy and be receptive to new energy. Wash your hands, keep yourself clean physically. It matters to the people you're serving. And finally, I would suggest that, that you just be prepared to joyfully accept whatever happens in this space. As Sarah and Kinthia and George and Lene have said, we're open and accepting for the people that we serve and their own processes, things happen that are difficult to accept sometimes. And I've seen it happen in my own service. People are sometimes taken and given medical care, which includes forced sedation. That happens. People are sometimes taken into custody, to law enforcement custody. That can happen. We have a duty not to get in the way of other service providers who are doing their job. You can speak up and be an advocate for the people that you are caring for, but sometimes things happen out of our control and guests are taken out of our hands and into the hands of other service providers. And it can be challenging to witness that. So we have to do it with as much grace and understanding as possible and understand that those service providers are also trying to give the best of themselves and doing their work and their jobs, which is often challenging. So be compassionate towards them as well and try to understand that they're also part of the Zendo process. So I'm going to take some questions or invite others to uh, add some of their own thoughts about ethics. Could we do a time check, Lene? Do we have any time for questions?
one question right here in the front row. Um, you mentioned two reasons why the law enforcement. Somebody is saying they want to hurt themselves. There's a protocol that the Zendo follows to do that. Do you work with the crisis intervention team for ESD and those? Perhaps you'd like to answer that question. <laughs> All right. Well, here's my understanding of, uh, of that protocol. Uh, we're going to have a speaker from emergency services department here who will be up and will address that question in more depth. There is a crisis intervention team that the emergency services department has here on the playa that is comprised of uh, psychiatrists, counselors, psychologists, professional um, caregivers. And they are called often when there is a situation where somebody is threatening to hurt themselves or others. And they're very good at what they do. They work really hard and we should support them. And I'm sure that our ESD speaker will have more to say about that. Thank you all. I'll be around if other people have questions. So what we're going to start off with is a skit. Um, and in this skit, we are going to have two of our volunteers and, um, sorry, two of our volunteers. Um, come in and demonstrate a situation where someone is having an experience and they're coming into the Zendo. Um, and we're going to lo be looking as we watch this skit at the four basic principles. So once again, that's creating a safe space, sitting, not guiding, talking through and not down, and difficult is not the same as bad. So as you watch this skit, just note, just take note of, okay, where do these four principles show up? Where do I see them? Um, being enacted in the situation. So this is Shannon, Ryan, and Terrence. All right. Yeah, I think it's good. Hi, welcome. Hi there. I, uh, I found this guy. He's having a Hi. great time wandering around on the playa. And I thought uh, he could probably use your help. Oh, you're at the Zendo. What's your name? Hi. Hi. I'm Shannon. You're at the Zendo, and um, this is a safe space that we sit with people, and they can have their experience, and I'll, keep, I'll create the safe space. What's happening right now? Really cold. Really cold? cold. Why don't we take a seat? I don't know how this works. Can you, can you help me? It's my job. We usually don't have a microphone in the center, just so you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really, really thirsty. I don't know when I had any water last. Thank you. Some water right here. This is some filtered water. Does this, does this have LSD in it? Because I had water earlier and it, I think it had LSD in it. You think you're on LSD right now? I think so. Yeah. I, think so. Yeah. I can promise you that that water does not have any LSD in it. Okay, thank you. I'm really, really lost. Yeah. What, what am I supposed to, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Here? Yeah, can you tell me what to do? Anything that comes up for you, anything you want to say or do, as long as it's something that doesn't harm yourself or somebody else, then it's okay. What's happening right now? I'm, I'm lost. I just, I, this is really, really hard. I think I, I just had too much. 
I, I don't even know if this is LSD. I don't even know. Just a bunch of my friends told me to drink some stuff. Okay, do so you feel your leg? It's shaking. See that? Yeah, that, that sometimes happens when I, I get this like yeah. thing here and it won't stop. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's the shaking? Tell me. I don't, I don't know. Can you fix it for me? I can't fix it. I don't know if it needs fixing. It looks like your body's telling us something. I'm scared. Look, we're in this space. You see the ground? Yeah. We're here. You see me? I'm here. Yeah. You're here. Yeah. I feel you. Look, you yeah. exist right here. You're really pretty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Are you an angel? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I could be. <laughs> Am I dead? No, you're not dead. <laughs> I see you right here. Do you feel your body? It looks like a living body. Did I, did I pee myself? No, just some water. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why did I pee? I'm sorry. We'll get you cleaned up. We'll get you cleaned up. Do you want to be cleaned up? It's okay. Would you like a hug? Can I have a hug? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan and Shannon. Um, so just a couple people, can you tell me just a couple principles and where you saw them show up in this skit? Anybody? Any of the four principles that we have? Okay. At the beginning where she says, do you want the hood on the front? It's not like, no, you're doing that wrong. It's like, I'll find out what you want and I'll help you with it. Like, that seems to me like uh, sitting rather than leading. Thank you. Straight away. She was in a space of non-judgment, kind of meeting where he was at. Um, just kind of very big and very accepting. And when, when, she, uh, com when he complimented her instead of, Mm -hmm. Yeah, just that she met him where he was at, and when he was, you know, telling her that she was really beautiful, she just allowed that to be and didn't um, try to avoid it or change it, but just allowed him to have his experience, it's cre creating a safe space. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now we are going to move into, um, Lene, do you want to introduce the medical? Great. Okay, so now we're going to hear from some people with um, the medical team. And just real quick, is there a Ron from Burning Man Medical here? Because I haven't seen you. Okay. Well, I would like to introduce Derek, Wes, and Cole. And Cole. And they're going to review some basic medical assessment <laughs> tools and also talk about um, signs for dehydration, overheating, hypothermia, and we have a medical volunteer on every shift, and they're in charge of doing this assessment, and they're also in charge of making the call for if we ever do need to triage for medical. If we don't offer medical care in the Zendo besides basic first aid, so if we do ever encounter a medical situation, we have to call medical on the radio and they come out and meet us. So in addition to providing this information, I'd like to open it up to Q&A and we have three very knowledgeable people to answer your questions. Sorry, yes. I'll be real quick. I just wanted to check in. I uh, met with a bunch of people about the schedule. We filled some holes. So that's great. Thanks for those of you that were checking. There is one medical shift still open now. It's not the one I mentioned before. It is actually Monday from 2 a.m. to 8 a.m., which is right the wee hours of the morning after the temple burn. Um, and so we're talking to people, um, but I wanted to make sure that was announced. If you are a medical volunteer or any, um, would possibly be interested in filling out, we might be able to get you to switch with someone else um, for another shift. 
um, but just 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 FYI. Um, and people in general, I gave me asked several questions about if they could just come by and check in other times when they're not on the schedule. Um, and the answer to this is yes, you're encouraged to come by. We never know when there could be holes or more people, and you're welcome to come. But the space itself, we can't have too many people in it, so you just need to understand that we might not be able to give you things to do. Um, we might have to ask you to leave if there's too many people. But it's also a good time to mention that this like golden onion dome thing out here is a volunteer hangout space for the Zendo volunteers. So if you want to come and hang out with the people of the Zendo because we're so cool all the time, even when you're not on shift, then you're welcome to do so. Um, so and then you can meet other people, you can have conversations, you can talk. We just try to keep that space out of the Zendo itself so that the Zendo can be what it's for. So thank you. I just want to make one very snippet, small announcement before I forget. Um, and at the expense of sounding like a party pooper prude, the skit that you just saw did illustrate some of the principles very, very well. There was one exception. Um, it is 2 Tuesday, and you know, all the time we should be expressing ourselves however we want. However, when you're on shift, um, it would be in everyone's best interest to dress modestly and to be fully covered in order to make all of the guests and other volunteers comfortable. So it's up to your own discretion, but um, but please dress appropriately during your shifts. Hello, I'm Derek, uh, and this is Wes and Cole, and we're all psychiatrists. Uh, we just got asked to do this impromptu, but we got some notes, so it's going to be somewhat organized. But we'll open up for questions at the end in case we miss anything. Um, and we all have an interest in psychedelic-assisted therapy, and that's our kind of career goal. So um, I guess we'll open it up with Cole. He's going to talk a little bit about safety. All right, so uh, thank you for having me. A lot of my heroes are in this room. I noticed them. Um, Anyhow, uh, I just wanted to say a few words about safety. Um, having been in the Zendo tent last year, I think um, it's good to remember that we really don't know what people took, no matter what they tell us they took. We don't have the technology available to us here for reasons, and some people have no idea what actually they've ingested. So to keep that in mind, <clears throat> saying that the uh, it's hard for people to really know exactly what they've taken was the essence. Um, it's also important to remember we have things for sort of gauging somebody's health, but we are not prepared to manage a medical crisis. So if you see somebody who's taken something like GHB or alcohol or Valium, um, Keep in mind those things can stop your breathing, and we're not ready to handle that. So trust your judgment. If you're one of the medical team leaders, um, trust the sitter's judgment. If they're coming to you and they think there's a medical situation, have a low threshold for really considering it. Okay. And that was everything. <laughs> So the, uh, for, the, for the medical people, the, the tools we have are a blood pressure cuff and a pulse oximeter, a thermometer, but I do want to stress that we are not there to treat. We're there to know when to call emergency services and they can come out and evaluate the, the participant there and take them to medical if they need it. We have the, uh, radios that connect directly to emergency services. So again, we do want to have a fairly low threshold. We, we don't want anything bad to happen and, and have this whole, shut, the whole thing shut down. So, um, But some of the things to look out for when you're sitting for someone, a big one will be dehydration. So if you notice that their mouth is really dry, their lips are chapped, you can offer them water. We have some electrolyte solution, um, but, but we don't have a, a ton of it. So um, really, when, when use it sparingly or really when necessary when, when their mouth is dry um, you can pinch their skin and see if there's any skin turgor but that is, is really something um, medical people will probably be if you have if you have any question call the medical lead over um, 
some drugs, there is a lot of MDMA, um, which can cause serotonin syndrome, or a lot of the psychedelics operate on the serotonin system. And some of the symptoms of that are hyperthermia, um, muscle rigidity, and twitching. Um, Significant GI upset. For those who aren't medically trained, can you say what hyperthermia is? <clears throat> Super hot. Hyperthermia is elevated hot. body temperature. Um, and that can also lead to seizures and confusion. It can be difficult to, to tell if someone is confused because they're on a drug, because they're dehydrated, because there's an underlying psychiatric issue. A lot of times, only time is gonna tell that. Um, but again, I think if, if we do have significant concern that someone is um, a danger to themselves or, to, um, or, or medically compromised or a danger to others, then we want to move it up the ladder and get a higher level of care. <clears throat> some of the stimulants can cause some paranoia, which can lead to aggression and violent behavior. And that's something that can be dangerous for other people in the Zendo. If someone is getting to that level, we want to try to, to get them away from other people that might be creating space in the Zendo for them or getting them to walk outside and take a little walk and see if that helps them kind of chill out a little bit, but we don't want to be restraining people and put other people in danger. Yeah, I will add, uh, I'm, I'm Wes by the way, everybody. I will add too that I, I'm not sure exactly what our policy is for the Zendo about restraining people, so we'll defer to Lene, whatever she thinks is most appropriate. But yeah, definitely we can talk people down and just try and diffuse the situation. Just because violent, like paranoia can lead to aggression, and aggression it can actually cause harm to the person who's intoxicated, as well as other people. So really it benefits everybody to kind of diffuse the situation. Stimulants, too, can increase blood pressure, which can cause uh, you know, uh, more problems as well. Uh, you know, in extremes, it can cause chest pain and like uh, heart problems. Uh, but honestly, this is something I wouldn't expect anybody to make diagnoses of unless you have a medical background. So again, uh, ask the medical person on the shift. Other stuff to be aware of in the stimulant category is MDMA frequently is sold as many different things, or many different things are sold as MDMA. So it can, the MDMA is pretty safe mostly, but uh, a lot of the other stimulants have lower uh, therapeutic indices, meaning they can be toxic at only like one or two doses versus MDMA, which is maybe safer. Uh, though MDMA also can lead to an increase in body temperature and it can cause people to think uh, they need to drink a lot of fluid and that can lead to electrolyte disturbances. So watch out for that as well. Don't, you know, people who may be uh, worried on MDMA, they may say, oh, I need to drink, you know, eight glasses of water, and that can lead to problems too. I would say that hallucinogens in general are pretty safe uh, looking at LSD, except for a recent one called uh, 25I or 25I MDOME. Cole knows a lot about this. I'll let him say a little blurb about it. Uh, I don't know a lot about this, but oh, my time here last year um, educated me on this. Uh, the 25 NBOME series uh, does have a lethal dose, and LSD has a lethal dose of infinity. Lethal dose means when you give rats a certain milligram per kilogram, how many of that kills 50% of the rats? So, um, again, with knowing what you, what, assuming that you know what the patient has taken or the person has taken, um, one interesting thing is that apparently 25NBOME is only absorbed buccally or in your mouth. LSD can be absorbed in your GI tract. So if you know people who take large doses of LSD, tell them to swallow it. That's all I know. <laughs> and, and to further clarify that a little bit, the, the 25i is only going to be absorbed if it's held in your mouth. If you were to take 25i and swallow it, it would have no effect. So if somebody tells you that they took something they thought was acid, but they had to hold it in their mouth uh, in order to get high, like that's what the person who gave it to them said, that's a big tip off to say, hey, this is probably this 25i, and 25i is a little bit more dangerous than acid, and a lot more dangerous. And so we want to say, okay, this is something to watch out for. Well, it's bitter. Yeah, that, that's another good point, that uh, people who take 25i will report it has like a bitter chemically taste, 
it lingers for maybe 40 minutes to an hour. They say keep it in your mouth for that duration of time. So it's sold as LSD a lot of times, but it's not. And you can tell because it has this bitter taste. And again, you have to hold it in your mouth for this duration. You can also tell because you can go to sleep at like hour eight. Yeah, so th this is another good point. The time course of LSD is, you know, you can, it's difficult to sleep even 12 hours after for most people, but 25 by, it's a lot easier to get to sleep later. So I, I don't know if in the exact situation when someone's coming in when they're intoxicated, if they're going to be able to, you know, tell you if they're sleepy or not, but that's something to know about it too. So again, uh, you, we talked about the stimulants, we talked about the hallucinogens right now. There's the higher risk, I would say, is with the downers, the, the depressants and the sedatives. So GHB, alcohol, opiates. Alcohol usually isn't that bad on its own, though certainly you know, we can know from personal experience it can be pretty awful. But especially when it's mixed with benzos or other medications, it can really, they can synergize and really cause people to stop breathing. Panic attacks, another thing I wanted to cover, it can seem like a heart attack at times. A lot of people show up to the ER and say, you know, I think I'm having a heart attack. Turns out they're having a panic attack. They're breathing fast, they're sweating, they're really uncomfortable. So be aware that, you know, especially with the stimulants, people may say, oh, I'm freaking out, I don't know what it took, I'm gonna die. It can really lead to a panic attack. But usually these things pass within 20 minutes. Just let it kind of ride out. Uh, again, you can ask the medical person if you're worried about them having a heart attack or something like this, but not that likely. And uh, one last thing is, confusion can show up in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, people won't know generally what where they are, maybe. They don't know what date it is. They won't know who the president is. These are like really simple tests you can say, like, is this person really with it? And if they, if they don't know those uh, answers, then it, it, it is kind of a red flag that you want to worry about. Like, you know, really high blood pressure can cause confusion. Uh, you know, serotonin syndrome can cause confusion. So you just watch out for that one. I think we pretty much covered everything we decided was important, so we want to open it up for questions. And certainly, you know, we, there's a lot of more things we can talk about, but, I, you know, anybody who has a question, feel free to ask. I'll be around, too. And we'll, yeah, we'll be around afterwards as well. Do we have any um, protocols for uh, dealing with confusion that might be from, like, a blood sugar uh, issue? So the question was, do we have any protocols for dealing with confusion that may be from a blood sugar issue? And I don't think we have any, any way to measure like a blood sugar with like the, uh, the strips, for example. So that would be nice to have. But yeah, emergency services as well. Emergency, emergency services as well. Yeah. yeah so in, in those cases, we can always refer to emergency services, especially if someone has a history of diabetes, and we're worried that that's kind of causing some alteration and like confusion or how they're behaving. Yeah, just a word about this confusion, which could come with low blood sugar, could come with the high blood pressure, could come with low blood pressure from not having enough fluids, could come from hyperthermia. Basically, a lot of the medical phrases we've been using, and um, they may have in common what we call, you know, delirium, and that is a really dangerous situation. And the signs of delirium, this is really easy to figure out. Do they know their name? Do they know where they are? Do they know why they're there? Those kinds of questions, if they don't necessarily know those answers, um, it's pretty hard to get to that state that you don't remember that stuff. And you probably aren't walking if you're in that state and not delirious. I would say even after taking a high dose of uh, hallucinogens, most people are still oriented to where they are. You know, oh, I'm at Burning Man. Oh, you know, I took something. I know what, you know, is, what season is it? Oh, okay. It's, uh, they're going to be able to know. <laughs> Yeah, is it hot or cold? And people who are confused and delirious, they, they won't necessarily answer this question correctly. So they'll be like, oh, okay, let's, let's talk to the medical question. person, get this person some more care. Anyone else? Any other questions? How, how about you back there? Are you guys aware of uh, any uh, harm reduction resources or test kits around? Uh, the question was, are there any resources, harm reduction resources like test kits around? And I, to my knowledge, I don't know, but maybe we we'll read this. Not here that I know of. Not here that we know of. But I, I bet Lene, they would be probably, they can comment on that. Uh, if not now, then when, next time. Uh, can I also mention that it's good practice to, if there's ever any sudden change in status of that person, so they come in, they kind of know who they are, yeah. and they're, they're still a little bit chatty, and all of a sudden they just drop, that would be, or you're hanging out with them, and all of a sudden they're not listening to you anymore. Any sudden change in status is when you would want to maybe alert your medical person.
Yeah. And I'll, I'll repeat that so everybody could hear it. Her concern was that if, if somebody has a sudden change in their status or their behavior, like let's say they're really chatty for a while and then suddenly they're just like, you know, going to sleep. I mean, you know, that, that's probably a bad example, but, uh, you know, some gross change in how they're behaving suddenly, that's something that's say, okay, maybe this is another red flag we should be worried about, potentially. So dehydration is, a, is like a spectrum of fine to death. Right. Where, where, where on the spectrum do you start wanting to get the medical? So this is a question on dehydration. It's a, this gentleman commented, it's a spectrum. So it starts out very minor. You know, we're all probably pretty dehydrated right now, but when it's very, very bad, you know, uh, it's going to be worse, right? You're going to have cracked lips, for example, dry tongue. Uh, Derek was commenting on skin turgor. Uh, there's also something called capillary refill that you could, so there's little tests that you can do on the physical exam that can tell how dehydrated someone is. At the very worst, people can pass out because they don't have enough blood volume to circulate. But really, I think that the first intervention when we suspect dehydration, which is pretty much everybody at Burning Man, is to give them some water and ideally give them some water with electrolytes because that's going to hydrate a lot better than if we just give water by itself. Water with electrolytes and sugar. So if we don't have electrolyte solution, maybe a small snack, cracker, or something like that. Salts and sugars help absorb water. Um, I also just wanted to say, uh, a treatment would start when they say they're thirsty, and then um, when it's actually starting to overwhelm the system, the first kind of easy way to tell is to take their pulse. But if you're worried enough to be taking their pulse, just talk to the medical person. Um, the first thing that will happen with volume depletion or loss of fluids from whatever source, bleeding or sweating too much and dancing and having a great time, um, is your heart rate, your heart will start to work faster. And then when it can't work any faster, it will start working as hard, and then you get into real trouble. We, we will have snacks. We'll have snacks in the Zendo for in these instances. And I just wanted to let you all know that Dance Safe donated some testing kits to the project. So they can't be used in the space, but someone can ask for one and borrow it to use. So you guys can ask one of the shift leads or me or Lene or Sarah, and we'll, we'll get that for you. So I think we have time for one more question, and we'll be around after if you want to talk. Um, you mentioned uh, a lot of concerns for me as to know who they are or where they are. Yeah. But I've been witness to um, people with dissociatives being completely safe. They're not going to die. Right. But they have no idea who they are or where they are. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Any specific dissociative um, in mind? Well, I mean, ketamine or this new stuff called Demexi. Demexi, I can't speak on. Maybe you can teach me a little about it. Um, but with ketamine, one of the kind of good things, I guess you could say, about ketamine is that it is an anesthetic. And when somebody's taking a psychedelic dose of ketamine, they're by definition having trouble getting up and getting themselves into trouble. Probably won't. <laughs> probably won't present to Zendo. It's actually why we don't see a lot of it in like emergency rooms and things as well. PCP, on the other hand, is basically ketamine plus something that is very stimulant, so it's dissociative and you're running amok in the city. Yeah. I, would, I can also look. I'll just say, I think MXC does have a longer half-life, and I don't know how sedative it is, so certainly someone could be intoxicated on it and present here, but I... I testing? Yeah. I, I don't know uh, how that really shows up, because I haven't seen it too often. Thank you very, very much. Now that you've heard from the two medical speakers, well, the four medical speakers, I just want to really emphasize that if you have a medical question, ask. If you have a medical concern, ask. If you just have a weird feeling that something could be medically related and you're not sure, ask. Don't hesitate for any reason at all. This is the number one most important thing in this work. We have two MERS radios and a roamer will have one of those and then we'll have one inside of this space and that can contact ESD if we do need to triage and dispatch help from ESD. 
A lot of people here are interested in finding out more about clinical trials that um, are looking at therapeutic uses of psychedelics. Uh, there are different controlled clinical trials going on, and my friend Amy Emerson, who is MAPS's clinical program manager, is here this week. So I just want to introduce her. Amy, if you could stand up, and she'll be on some shifts. 